Hello, people. Slightly earlier time for Academy because we've got a double bill today. So I can see we've got 12 people here already. So that's nice. Who's here? Say hi. Hello, people. Slightly earlier time for pass Academy. Me. Turn past me off. Nobody wants past me. <laughs> Oh, my comments were hidden. Beverly, hello. Roberta. Yeah, we are here. Sorry. Yeah, technical issues. There's always a technical issue of some description. I got quite interested recently, though. I did a, a lovely live with uh, Tanya Adkins um, on the Send Family Instincts page, and she uses uh, a streaming service that I've not seen before. Um, so I'm going to look into that. It looks really good. 18 of you. Lovely. So we've got quite a good one today. I mean, I personally think all of them are great, um, but today's is really lovely because we've got, um, at first we've got a young autistic advocate um, or young autistic person uh, discussing how they think it would be useful to explain in hopefully a positive way um, what it means to be autistic to young people, um, which is nice because they are a young person themselves. Some of us on here are a little bit older than than something that be, where we could be classed as a young person. Um, and then we've got Dr. Melanie Hayworth, um, who will be discussing and using a presentation as well to demonstrate how you might want to explain autistic experience to your autistic young people. Um, and what's lovely about that as well is that they uh, co-authored um, and, the, and it was illustrated by another autistic person, a book on exactly the same thing. So how to explain autistic experience to young people and children, which is good. Um, and so hopefully that will be useful for everybody. We've had this one has been requested a number of times about how to do this, how to go about it. So hopefully this will be really useful for people. Uh, we've also, who, who else are we saying hello to? So there's Pam, hello Pam. Uh, in Canada, lovely. Uh, and Caitlin. Oh, Caitlin, Sam's proud mum. Oh, lovely. Um, is Sam here as well? So obviously, um, we've got the session to start with Tigger talking to Sam. So if anybody has any questions or any lovely comments, feel free to pop those in the comment box. Uh, so I think we've just gone five past seven. So I think we shall start. And I need to disappear. And now I need to figure out how to disappear. <laughs> Right. Hi, everybody, and welcome um, to this awesome talk on Academy. Um, for once, the others aren't here, and you've got me, Tigger, and it's my first one, so I'm a little bit nervous, I must confess. I've got my blue tack here, and I'm drinking bits of water. But I'm really looking forward to this because I've got the awesome delight of having a chat with Sam. Now, we did actually do this yesterday, and my internet let us down. So Sam, who's awesome, has very kindly agreed to do this again. So we're going to go through some questions and we're going to explore the awesomeness that is Sam. So really, I think without further ado, I will pass over to Sam and I'm checking my questions to make sure I'm OK. And I'm just going to work through them and see what awesome insights we get into Sam's gorgeous brain and his world. So, Sam, over to you. Tell us really who you are and what your special interests are. And welcome. Oh, hi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so my name's Sam. I'm 17 years old and I live in Oxfordshire. Uh, my special interests include um, geography, which, um, which relates to maps and so sometimes alternate history as well, and political geography, uh, data and statistics, maths, and learning about the way people interact and socialise. My One of my former interests is the number seven, which I first became interested in due, because of a children's TV show that I used to watch. And I, I, from this show, I had a paper number seven that I used to carry around with me, as well as many other sevens made out of cardboard and stuff like that, which as opposed to items that neurotypical children might carry around, like teddy bears or something. And I was also interested when, when I was younger in numbers in general, technology and computer programming. Lush. We, we talked quickly yesterday. Um, I remember, but I've got to ask again, what was the TV show? It was Number Jacks. And number had, jacks um, from all thick num numbers and one of them was a number seven 
number seven. And we did talk quickly as well about how my recognition of the number seven was throughout culture and throughout history. That number keeps reappearing and it is special from a um, a cultural viewpoint in various and, and religious viewpoint in various areas across the globe. It's a lucky um, number, yeah. Yeah, like I said to you earlier on, last night I was talking about the number seven and saying about it from a historical viewpoint to my partner and and saying, oh, this is really interesting. It is interesting how certain numbers do occur, which are gorgeous. Um, and your special interests are fab. Um, so seeing as I am a young, newly identified autistic individual, um, though a little bit older than you, um, it would be interesting to explore um, when, you know, um, when were you identified? When did you realise that you were awesomely autistic? So I, I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome officially in 2008 when I was five, but my I think my parents had picked up signs of it before then because when, when I was a baby, they noticed I'd move around in different ways to other children and at parties and social events, I wouldn't interact with them or pay much attention to them. But they noticed also that I had unusual memory and recall abilities like, um, I could be given a book and read it at the age of 10 months, or I could memorize all the presidents and capitals of, of the United States in alphabetical order. But they also noticed that I didn't really have a need or a care for friendships as well as I had echolalia as well, which um, which when I, when I wanted a drink when I was about three years old, I'd, I'd repeat the phrase, do you want a drink? Instead of, instead of can I have a drink? Just, mm. just, just because I, I knew the phrase of, of a drink in it. I, I didn't really give it much thought. The, the the reading bit interests me. I, I didn't say this before, but I must confess, um, when I was a youngster, I loved books. I love books and I love science. Oh, yes. um, terrible at maths, as we said, but I'm a classic kind of astronomer, physicist and so on. But when I was younger in my hometown of Wolverhampton, I um, I finished all the books I wanted to read in the children's library. And I, I don't know, you know, I can't remember what age you have to be to go into the adult bit of the library. But I went to them and I explained to them what I, who I was, what I wanted to read, and that I'd finished the books in the children's library and they weren't any good. Wow. I, went, I went the books in the adult library. And they let me, they gave me a special t- ticket and they put my name on it. Oh, um, right. And they gave me a special ticket so I could start reading the books in the adult part of the library. And, you know, I must have been, <clears throat> I must have been, I don't know, 13 or so. So I, I was into reading from a very early age as well. Um, and was, but I, I loved reading and still do i love the smell of books as well that is me i love oh, yeah. the smell of books especially a, a new book that you get. Oh, yes 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 no. um when I, I i get them i've just ordered one in the post about um i, I like outdoor stuff as well it's about somebody climbing everest and i, I can't wait to get it and i'm just going to sit there and go because it will smell gorgeous and i love that but there is something there's something to be special about books which i don't get online um so awesome stuff so th- this one yesterday I thought was fantastic. So um, how did your family explain to you that you're awesomely autistic? So um, I don't think my family ever really explained being autistic to me when, when I asked them about, when I asked my parents about it, they don't really specifically remember having a proper conversation about it with me. The subject, I, I suppose I was four or five years old, but throughout my childhood, I suddenly heard it said to me until I really took it on board and later it became part of my identity. And they always understood it as something that was positive and something that I just was, but rather than something that was wrong with me, it was completely fine by them and even special and cool. I, I think that's awesome. I really think that's awesome. I think that for you to realise your identity is positive, to realise who you are is awesome, is an amazing start in life. And I think, as I said, I think your your family is, is lush to actually give you that I think it's gorgeous um and it's interesting the journey they've been on I think um do they do they do any you know do they do you talk to them about you know how you interact with the world around you from your brain or do they just awesomely exist alongside you uh I I I go to them if I have any worries about anything socially or or like that but mainly they just they exist alongside me I guess cool being able to go to them is gorgeous, really yeah, gorgeous. Yeah. Um, so how do you understand um, being autistic? So for me, being autistic is simply a neurological wiring that's different from most other people, different from the neurotypical wiring. 
I don't like to consider it a disorder or disability because that that implies that it's the wrong way for a mind to work rather than rather than just being different, which is what what I think it is. And I consider neurodiversity in general just to be another variable of the human condition as opposed to something that can be wrong with a person. I think that's I think that's fantastic. And I think you, you to, and we saw my, my, my thumb up really quickly. I totally totally agree with that. I, I do not like it. And I am offended now when people mark you as less yeah, yeah. different from a negative viewpoint. And I think, you know, I think your your viewpoint there, again, it's so positive. It's so refreshing to hear that, to understand that you are awesome with who you are and you should be accepted for who you are, which I think is is brilliant. So what what so you have this extremely positive outlook and understanding. Um, which I think is is gorgeous. So, what what so? I mean, expand a little bit. What what does it mean to be autistic to you? Is it how, uh, how do you how do you see that? I suppose it's just a part of my identity. Really, it's it's my, my neurological makeup, the way my the way my mind works. So I guess I guess that's how I describe it. Yeah, we yeah we've spoken about my my recent identification and how I'm still working things through. I could learn so much from someone like yeah. you. Um, which is really interesting. So um, going back again into your past, when did you when did you think? Well, hang on a minute. I'm and I'll use the word different, not in any negative yeah, yeah, way. But, you know, when did you go? Hmm. Uh, I think during primary school, um, I, I, I always subtly knew I was different from the other children I encountered, as in like I, I noticed how much they were talking to each other and taking part in group activities, but I never really thought about it all that much because I was I was still quite young, but. I recognised it a bit when I when I went to youth camps when I was about nine or ten. I'd, I I saw the other kids doing a lot of activities, but I didn't join in with them just because I didn't enjoy them, I guess. But I'd say it really hit me when I was sent to a, a new school for children with social and emotional difficulties. The vast majority of the children there were autistic as well. And at this school, I found the experience more comfortable. The, the style of how things work, both both pastorally and academically. And I felt, I felt like I belonged there and I realised I didn't really fit in all that well to my previous setting. That must have been quite um, an interesting revelation for you. I think I I, think I, I said mine was in the back garden and I just oh. stood there actually where I am now, pointing over that way and thought, hang on a minute. But like you, I'd always, yeah, I'd always felt I was different. I always felt like I didn't fit in. I always felt like, yeah, it was... And then just explored it, though it took me several decades yeah. to to explore it and to think around it. The school sounds really interesting. The fact that they, 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 you know, the fact that they they delivered their education in such a way that you felt like you fitted in better, that you felt more relaxed there, yeah. um, less anxious there, and so on. So, um, sensory issues. I have loads. Do you have any um, sensory needs? Uh, right, right now I don't have all too many to be honest. But one one thing I've never really liked is eating certain foods or foods that I find the taste of them too strong or loud noises like hand dries in the public toilet. Oh, God, yeah. I, 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 I did have I, I did have quite a few when I was younger. For example, my mum had to stop taking me into supermarkets when I was a baby because of the sensory overload from all the lights and people walking around. But and any kind of change will also make me feel kind of unsettled. And I'm, I'm not sure if this is related, but sometimes I felt the need to do things like stuff my tie into my ear in primary school. This this, this may have been sensory related or, or could have just been stimming, full form of stimming, but I can't really remember doing it all that much myself or the reason why I did it. But but like I said, nowadays I have very few issues like this. What was the, what were the foods that you didn't like or still uh, don't like? Certain kinds of cheese as well as certain vegetables. I, I, I just didn't like the taste of, so... I just wouldn't eat them. Do you like celery? Uh, it's okay. Uh -huh. oh, no, I, I, nah, no, celery to me, the smell, the taste, the texture, everything's wrong yeah. about celery. It's a bit of an old taste. Ugh. And yeah. we, we, we also, um, you know, noise is a real issue for me. I've, oh, yeah. I've got earbuds in and they're new and they're noise reduction ones. And I have to say, you know, that this, it makes, it makes me so less anxious in the environments I mean be it in a, a family environment or when I used to go out I relied on these big boats over the ear ones the other brands are available um, all the time they just made such a difference so and sudden noises I don't like and 
like we said before we just started today, um, this isn't where I normally record. So this isn't what I call my studio. And I said to you, my, my blue tack's here and I'm, I'm tearing the blue tack apart off screen. And it was just about that it doesn't feel right. No. And we, we spoke about that and I said, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't, this, this isn't where I should be doing <clears> this, but I've got no choice with a bit of broadband here. But the food yeah. food is interesting and, and sensory issues. It's interesting how you had lots of sensory issues and you don't so much now, which I think is good. Yeah, yeah, I've sort of grown out of them. Yeah, somehow. Which is cool. Yeah, I'd, I'd say maybe your your overall it might be your your overall level of anxiety is 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 less, I guess, and it's you know they're not so much of an issue. Yeah. Um, so so um, your social life throughout school and to now, um, what 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 was it like? Were there any issues with relationships with perhaps negative aspects like bullying and so on? So starting off in primary school, I didn't really try to interact meaningfully and make friends with other kids in my classes for the simple reason I didn't know how to do it. But the, the, the other children acknowledged me and accepted me in, in class, but they never really integrated me into any of their proper social groups. And in, in year five, my parents recognised that my original primary school wasn't really right for me socially and they transferred me to a new school. Because of this anxiety, because of my anxiety at the new school, I, I resorted to speaking in a high voice whenever I spoke. Because, because this setting was less academically and more socially focused, I, I found making acquaintances and friends quite, quite a bit easier. But still, like close friendships was still something I didn't know how to initiate. But I, but I, I saw other kids doing it, but I, I didn't. Well, I, I had a few friends, but I, I just didn't know. Mm. I, I, didn't, I didn't find common interest with them, really. As When I got to year seven, I moved up from the primary unit of the school to the, the main body of the school, which had quite quite a few more people. There, 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 were, only, there were only eight in my tutor group and about 56 in the whole school, but I guess it, it, was, it, it was bigger. So I was placed with more people, which helped me forge better friendships with people and I, I could find common interests with them like, like there was one person interested in computer programming who I, who I did made some games with but I, th I think the greatest improvement during my time at secondary school was a sailing trip that I went on <clears throat> in year nine when I was 13. On, on this trip I, I stopped using my high voice to talk after more than four years of using it and after this, I found it a lot easier to socialize in any any situation, but I was still quite impulsive with my speech and I'd say some things that I sometimes regret. But this, this did gradually improve when I, when, I, when I went to do my GCSEs where I could easily interact and enjoy my, my social circle, but I, I still lacked a bit of confidence and had trouble with initiating conversations. So for the first sixth form, I transferred to a mainstream school, which had me start off quite well and improve quickly, but issues with starting conversations and looking people in the eyes they were they were still there mm. but I didn't really do too much to help myself integrate socially and during this time so because I missed out on a lot of opportunities that the school gave me like the school pantomime I, I, I like to watch that stuff I didn't really like to be in it you know so my, my social life continued like this until until the beginning of the first lockdown where one Sunday afternoon, I discovered a book laying on my shelf, which I, which I had for quite a few years. But um, I, I, re I read it for the first time, and after after I did it, immensely helped my confidence and my social issues in ways that I'd never really experienced before. And over the summer, I was quite keen to get back into school and try out my try out my new schools, which I did in in September. I felt like it was improving more strongly than ever before. And, I now have quite a few friends and acquaintances and I'm feeling confident about the future. Thanks. And, and for, throughout all of this, I haven't ex experienced too much bullying. If, if you like, if I can I can remember one example in primary school. And back, back then people just did it to get a reaction out of me because they knew I was different. So I, I'd created a club based around my special interest at the time, which was the number seven. I, I called it the seven club. And it, it was really just um, a sectioned off bit of the playground behind a temporary building that I mm -hmm. kind of, proclaimed as my own. Uh, during one summer holidays, I became interested in the idea of each member of the club needing a passcode or a password to get in. So so um, I, I, gave, I gave every every member of a club, which is really just everyone who came by, a, a six-digit passcode, which I gave to them on the first day back in September. But, um, mo most people accepted it, but one girl I gave it to just, just said, she said, I don't want it anymore. And 
ripped it up and threw it on the ground and which as you can imagine quite quite upset me but beyond that i haven't really experienced too much firsthand i'm so glad you haven't and it's, it's interesting to see the journey you're on because you're you're understanding yourself more i'm on that journey you're adapting how you interact with other people i still say things that cause issues i still have that oh, yeah. um oh, you know when you all of a sudden it comes out and you just can't block it it might be true it might be factual but not at that time for the other person in the oh, environment yeah. or the other people you just sit there going oh yeah and beat yourself up for the rest of the day about it i know yeah yeah i um there's um uh i don't know if they're called memes or image i found on the internet and it's of a it's got a picture of a brain and inside the brain it's got an angel talking oh. and then outside the brain it's got like this monster talking and oh, the right. person says that's what i'm thinking inside but when it comes out it's not supposed to be that and i keep saying that i'm like see look it's that angel but again honestly inside i wasn't thinking how it sounded it just and i i, I do i still have to my ripe old age try very hard not to say the wrong thing yeah yeah um but the, 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 the fact you haven't had much negative issues around, you know, friends, social interactions is really good. It's really good to hear as well. Um, a lot of people do, sadly, but I'm really glad that you haven't. So um, what, what what do your family and friends think about you being awesomely you, awesomely autistic you? So I'll start off with talking about my parents. Um, my mum said that being me being autistic has enriched her life as well as find, finding it easier to understand other people. And she thinks that raising neurotypical children, um, parents take everything for granted. But if your child's autistic, you have to work at things more because people don't understand their basic operating system, if you like. And my, my dad likes that I, that I have... Um, skills that others don't have and how i've changed over the years and where i am now he used to be a bit worried about my lack of confidence and maturity but now he likes that i can see myself as someone else might and his partner also thinks my increasing confidence makes her wonder if i am actually autistic but you and i both know the answer to that question <laughs> we do yeah. um it's, it's like i was i i I, I've, I've thought sometimes of just getting images and you know that 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 question but you don't look autistic yeah you're thinking, don't seem autistic i know and you're like you know and am i supposed to have a third eye yeah, I'm supposed yeah. to have, have, you know you know and, and all that stuff and it, it does because i think we spoke i went somewhere recently and, and, and somebody was like wow you've come really far haven't you for yeah. someone who's autistic and i was like but that was just their perception at that moment in time. That the positivity, the posi positive way you talk about your family, I, I just love. I just absolutely adore. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm slightly jealous because, because, because as I said, my my mother passed away last year, and we never had that conversation. Um, and it, it was. I, I, I'm, I'm so glad, happy. It's and, and you know your face lights up. When you talk about yourself and you're positive and how people view your face just lights up and, and how your family are with you is gorgeous. Mm. Um, so so going back to other aspects of your or, or your life and so on, are there, are there any good relationships that, that have stood out with, with teachers and maybe what made them good? Yeah, yeah. I, I have a few thing, more things to say about my family and friends, if, you, if you'd like to hear that. But I yeah, I'd love to. Okay. Um, my, my sister likes, likes me being autistic because for the right or wrong reasons, everyone knew who I was. Everyone knew her as well. They used to say, are you Sam's sister on, on the playground and stuff? And um, and my, my friend said that talking to people I knew in primary school, that, that was easy, but for others it took a bit of extra work. And but I was friendly with everyone I came across and they... They noticed I was very good at maths and enjoyed the number seven, which I guess other people didn't so much. Yeah. I must confess, I'm going to go and look more at the number seven now. I have to be honest, because uh -huh. because I am slight, I'm a geek. I am slightly interested in stuff, and it does occur a lot. Um, and it, it again, it's just so cool. Your family have so positively, you know, reinforced that you are awesomely autistic and there is nothing wrong with being awesomely autistic and just yeah. being you yeah. which i think is wonderful so thanks for that extra little bit but and and thinking what's the next one it was it was are there any relationships that have that have that are, are friendships like with teachers or that have stood out for you over the your your, your years 
So from my schooling, I've had a few good relationships with teachers and other staff, including a teaching assistant to my primary school, who I mostly had as a one-to-one -one aide from reception all the way to when I left in year five. Um, all the form tutors I had in secondary school as well, who they were always very supportive of me and, and my learning. And as well as my head of, my head of sixth form, who's helped me immensely with A-level maths and preparing for university. And I, th I think what made them all good was the volume and ease of communication we had and their ability and commitment to help me if I needed anything. Oh, that is gorgeous. Um, I, I, I mentioned that I had a, <laughs> I'm a closet physicist. I love space, quantum theory, the universe, philosophy, but mass eludes me completely for some reason. Yeah. And I had a guy called uh, Mr. Stravinsky, who oh, may yeah. or may not be out there still. And he, he stayed on after school. He sat with me. He helped me. And he's someone I remember from my youth. But it was that bit about he just got me as who I was and, and tried his best as a teacher. And I think, and I'd be the next teacher as well, I know. I hope that, 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 you know, that for some individuals, teachers can make such a difference to your brain, such a difference, and they can excite interests and passions and then listen to your interests and passions, the number seven and so on and so forth, which is gorgeous. Yeah. Um, so th this, this, this is a brilliant one. How would you advise parents to, to explain being autistic to their children? What thoughts so, have you got? The first thing I'd clarify when explaining autism to a child is there's absolutely nothing wrong with being autistic because that's that's what they may presume through people's reactions and ideas to it. And I then explain what is my view of being autistic, which is that it's a, it's a different way the mind can work with advantages and disadvantages over the neurotypical brain wiring. It's it's not better, it's not worse, it's just different. And that, uh, it's good. It's because some disadvantages you have social isolation and difficulty forming maintaining friendship sometimes mm. but also you have amazing abilities such as deep focus observation skills visual skills and creativity oh lush um any any words of words of wisdom for young autistic individuals uh, for young people on the spectrum you know in order to unlock your potential in terms of confidence social skills and understanding who you are i had to read the book the Aspicid secret book of social rules by jennifer coco tool that was that was the book I found on my shelf. Yeah. But but if, if if people watching some advice for myself, I've I've two pieces to give. The first is always communicate a worry you have to anyone who will listen. If if it's really bugging you, getting you down, any family member, a friend, or whoever who you think might listen, just just tell them because life's too short to keep worrying. The second, I'd, I'd say more important one, would be to put yourself outside of your comfort zone and keep setting yourself challenges. And in short, any, anything that scares you sort of, but inside you, you know you probably should do, you should just do it. Whether, whether that may be a certain social interaction that you, you might find daunting or or, or, or any, anything like that. Staying inside and not doing anything, it just doesn't compare to putting yourself outside of your comfort zone, gaining new experiences, and ultimately making your life worth something in the end. I think that's that's lush. Um, yeah, I'm going to agree with that. I have to push myself sometimes to get out of my comfort zone. Um, first coming on this was, and I think Academy was one of the first places I spoke that really, really was out of my comfort zone. Oh, now yeah. you can't get me off. Yeah, wow. I love it on this on this kind of environment. Um, and I do know my comfort zone is going to be challenged as we ease out, out of certain, out certain aspects of the lockdown. I've got to redo things which I've and, and do things which I don't want to do in some ways. Yeah. So that, uh, but you're right. I think that getting out of the comfort zone makes you grow. And you, and, you could do, and doing this, this this doing this talk as well. That's that's me putting myself outside of my comfort zone you know, as, as well. So, but you're really lot, good. Of, I mean, a lot of ways you can do it. There are there are, and I think I can I can remember what it was like for me the first time I did it. I was scared. I was really scared. I had masses of blue tag and tons of water. And I think I was moving around a lot and I was scratching my nose and I was really kind of like, and I, I was just, I didn't know what to do. Um, you are awesome. Um, to this already, love the way you come across, love your words of wisdom. So we're gonna, we're gonna um, end with, um, as I'm pulling my blue tag apart in front of my face, oh. with, um, do you have a favorite stim? So my favorite stim, I think it's, it's always been pressing my hands together like this, just 
when I when I'm excited when something stimulates me like numbers or data or anything I I do this some sometimes if I move up move if I'm up I move around as well while doing it and but most of the time I just use my hands and over the years I've had a few like rocking and repeating numbers and sometimes nonsensical words but I've always kept pressing my hands to this day oh I I I'm learning to embrace my stims I've got um from from, from Chloe Dr. Chloe, Dr. Potato Head, I love. Um, she she mentioned STEM tools oh, yeah. rather than STEM toys, which I think is really better. And I've just ordered myself some STEM tools, um, which I showed you an image of one, but I'll, I'll, uh, I've got this soft kind of llama thing I can smell and play with and and, and just smell and move around. And, and it, it's interesting. And I was, as you were saying that, I was, I was doing this, Oh, huh. see what it felt like and I thought actually that feels quite cool yeah and, and sometimes I do that oh yeah um but more often I, I need something externally in my hands and I love stimming I love stimming um and the idea of stim tools really 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 appeals to me mm. um this is like is there anything else you'd like to to say before we, we finish this awesome chat that we're having uh thank you for watching and i hope you've learned something anyone who's watching i guess i think well i think they have i have yeah. and i have to say you're a lot better than this than i was at my first time yeah. and your words of wisdom it's just it's just the positivity of you knowing who you are is incredibly refreshing from my viewpoint and you the, the way you put your information across I am off now to research the number seven. I've got to be honest. Oh yeah, because um, I just want to because it's so cool. Um, but I think what oh, the way you light up when you talk about yourself that I find so positive and so awesome, and the people around you recognise how awesome you are as well. So, Sam, this has been fantastic. Mm. Um, for those of you that might have listened to the first bit, this is our second go at this. So the first one went a bit, as they say, pear shaped and didn't work. But I would love. To, to Nata to you again and I have to say I think you've you know um, your idea your thought your words of wisdom you know something visual for that it would be really cool so thank you so much again for doing this I know it's been out of your comfort zone and and, and I'll say I'm a little bit like this isn't where I normally record it doesn't feel right it's been brilliant thank you so much and to everybody else out there um, watching listening thank you as well there are loads as ever more stuff to come. Keep checking the Academy website and the Facebook page. Um, and I'm sure you might see or hear more of Sam. You never know. Sam, thank you. Thank you so much. That's okay. And thank have you. a lush rest of the weekend and take care. Bye, thank everybody. Bye. Unmute. unmuting would be helpful um so yeah just me quickly popping back on um before starting the uh, dr melanie hayworth um sort of section if you like um hopefully you're hearing me okay because i can't see it coming up on facebook okay it's coming up okay good um the lag always confuses me um there were some really lovely comments i could see and i could see that sam was replying to people in in the comment section as well which was great there were a couple of people um who were sort of asking questions about you know how once they'd actually explained to you know your your, your young child that they were autistic that they didn't want to hear about it again or that they had a sort of negative idea about it perhaps because i saw something about um connecting it to another autistic child that they knew and they kind of didn't connect with that child maybe that child was very different to them because obviously as autistic people we're so so varied um so that is quite a struggle um so i made a comment in the comment section about how it is really important to sort of start to learn the difference between a label so a diagnostic label of i.e. person with autism so that's a diagnostic label um, and the difference between that and an autistic identity um, and so I think the next um, talk with Melanie Hayworth will be really quite useful for that too so we have that fantastic 
um, you know, young person perspective. Um, and now we've got Melanie's perspective and she does talk about, and I made it a meme because it was such a great thing that she said, which was um, that autism does define us. Absolutely. Because our whole, you know, the way our neurology and our bodies interact with the world is wholly autistic. So autism does define us but it doesn't confine us. And I thought that was such an amazing thing to say. And so trying to perhaps embody that in your family um, about the sort of the reality of being autistic, that it doesn't have to be a negative thing. And that really came across from Sam. And I think you'll find it quite useful with the next um, talk from Melanie. So I'm gonna disappear again and you can um, just hear from Melanie now. Sorry, I was just working out how to unmute myself. <laughs> um, hello, everyone, and welcome today to explaining autistic experience to um, children. I'm Dr. Melanie Hayward. Um, I'm representing Reframing Autism, and I'm also affiliated with Macquarie University. Um, and I wanted to thank Academy and Dr. Chloe Farahart for inviting me to talk to you today about um, autistic experience um, and how we chat about that with our children. It's a passion project of mine. Um, I am really convinced that the way we set up this conversation, this explaining autistic experience to children from the very first moment, um, is absolutely crucial to the way that they will continue to accept themselves as autistic individuals through their life. So this is a this is a big sort of topic for me where, that I think is really, really important. Um, and hopefully you can see the screen. It says I'm sharing um, and we can get underway today. So I know that most of you are in the UK or I think so, um, but nevertheless, I want to acknowledge country um, and the country that I am presenting to you um, from. So I acknowledge the country on which we meet today or virtually meet, um, the First Nations people who are the traditional custodians of the land from which I present to you today. And those are the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation um, here in Sydney, Australia. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and I extend that respect to any other Aboriginal people joining us today, um, although I recognise that's probably not very likely if you're a majority UK or it is, was, and always will be Aboriginal land. Okay, so before we sort of get underway today, I really just wanted to start with a little bit about who I am and why I'm here talking to you and why this is a passion project and all of those sorts of things so that you have a context for me. Um, I'm an autistic mother to three autistic children. Um, they're aged nine, just, just turned nine to 12. Um, and one of them is on the LGBTQIA plus spectrum um, and more gorgeous little people you couldn't meet. Um, all autistic, um, all multiple neurodivergent. I am an autistic researcher and educator. I've done some wonderful work with um, Liz Pelicano and Robin Stewart and, and Jack Den Houting last year on COVID-19 and the effects of um, the lockdowns, particularly in Australia, on um, autistic individuals and their families and our wellbeing. Um, I'm doing currently doing some fabulous research into um, the experiences of autistic parents and how they partner with their autistic children's schools and what those partnerships look like. Um, but really my deep passion is um, parenting and mental health and the, the nexus between those two things. 
I am also find myself to be an educator more than I thought I would be. Um, I'm doing a lot of professional development here in Australia for Australian professionals, um, particularly, obviously, those working with autistic children. So I'm the CEO and founder of Reframing Autism. Reframing Autism is an Australian-based charity, um, and our aim is to provide um, citizenship and empowerment, acceptance, respect for autistic identity, culture, um, and, and a real social um, movement for change in Australia in particular, but globally for more respect and acceptance around um, autistic identity and culture. Um, I'm undertaking a second PhD, that's always exciting, through Macquarie University. Liz Pelicano is my supervisor, and I'm doing that on um, parent mentalization capacity, particularly non-autistic parents and their capacity to mentalize for their autistic children. Um, that's part of the study, and the other part is then developing an autistic-led model of care to support those parents to build their mentalization capacity. So I'm very, obviously very passionate about autistic-led um, models of care, autistic-led education. Um, and that's what I'm going to say about my PhD in case I get into info dump mode. I'm also the author of Just Right For You, which is a delightful picture book for children um, and for adults, to, for parents really, to read to their children about their child's autistic identity. Awesome. So that's who I am. So what are we going to do today? When Chloe asked me whether I would talk about um, autistic experience, talking about explaining autistic experience to children, I was reflecting on some of the experiences that I have as an autistic adult talking to parents about talking to their children um, and about and a lot of the conversations I have with professionals are about how you can be a conduit, how you can translate between what autistic people would like to happen and what parents are actually um, have the capacity to do at any particular point, particularly early in their journey. So the first thing that I want to talk to you today about is actually not how we explain or what we say, but why. Why do we explain autistic experience to children? And I'll go into more detail in a minute about some of the reasons that parents say that they don't want to so that we can frame some responses around why you would actually talk to children um, about autistic experience. Then I'll go into a bit more about how we might do that and the different options that we've got as parents, as professionals, as autistic adults to talk to children explain to children about autistic experience. And the last thing I'll just very briefly touch on is whether we need to differentiate that conversation for the autistic children themselves and for their non-autistic peers, their siblings, their cousins, their family, friends, etc., who they might want to know about their autistic identity and how do we do that? How do we affect that conversation too? So the first thing we need to discuss is why explain at all? So as I said, when Chloe asked me about this, I was reflecting about my experiences talking to parents. And in my work with parents, I hear a number of reasons why they're concerned about telling their children about their autistic identity. Or alternatively, um, we'll get a question on our Facebook page saying, you know, I my child um, was diagnosed at three and he's 15 now and I feel it's time to tell him about his autistic identity. How do I go about doing it? Um, and obviously it's much harder than if you've just done it at three. So here are some of the reasons I hear. My child won't understand that and my child can't process that. Those two um, aspects are really prevalent in parents' And professionals as well, I'd have to say, thinking about why you wouldn't disclose an autistic, an autistic identity to children, why you wouldn't talk about that, is that they just won't understand it's too complex and they're not ready for it yet. Um, they can't process it, so what's the point? They won't get it. That kind of scenario. I don't want my child burdened. 
Uh, with the label, or I don't want to burden my child with the label of autism. That's another big one. Uh, obviously, the stigma and um, discrimination that comes with owning an autistic identity um, comes into play there for parents. An unusual one, usually at uh, when, when a child's at school, I will hear, I don't want my child to associate themselves and their autistic experience with that person's autistic experience, this other autistic child who might be severe or low functioning, um, you know, and I don't want my child to think that they're like him or her. Um, obviously, that one has a lot of unpacking to do uh, and a lot of checking of ableism. Um, but as I said, most of the parents I've worked with are quite early in their journey. Um, but nevertheless, this is one that is a concern for a lot of parents. My child doesn't need to know. That's a fairly basic one, but one that does come up quite regularly. And the conversation is too hard. And usually that is the, I've known for ages, and my child doesn't know, so how do I now have this conversation? Like it's one conversation. So I want to address all of these in turn. So my response to my child won't understand or can't process that is to scrap that. We, we can't think about that. What's more important is that we presume competence, obviously. We have no access to what your child, any child, can or can't understand or does or does it not. So really, um, it doesn't matter if a child has... Um, a particular ability or capacity to understand at any particular time because understanding evolves over time. What matters is, is that we continue to keep that conversation open and continue to be transparent and explicit and obvious in the way we discuss and objective, non-judgmental in the way we discuss any part of a child's identity and that we allow them to grow into that understanding. That way we don't presume that they can't or won't understand. We presume that they will grow into an understanding of their autistic identity. It's rather like, um, you know, um, a cultural heritage. You don't expect your child to that there to be one conversation about your child's cultural heritage which imparts everything that they need to know and that they will understand that and all the implications and, and the future implications um, in, in one moment. They grow into that understanding. They grow into their identity and that's the same for our autistic children too. So I don't want my child burdened with the label. Well, my usual thing um, is, is a twofold response to this. Um, used correctly, labels are simply value neutral descriptors. So labels don't have to be bad, they can just describe. Um, and in some ways, it's much better to have a correct objective label like autistic than for children to start to internalize messages like they're lazy or weird or difficult or challenging or stupid, those kinds of things. Um, which are all labels that many autistic children um, attract and, and, and internalise as who they are. I would much prefer a child to internalise that they are autistic, which is a true descriptor of who they are, than to internalise those um, subjective labels that um, are pejorative, are discriminatory, are stigmatising like, as I said, lazy and weird, um, you know, a loner, those kinds of things, all the words that as autistic adults we've heard as children, um, we don't want our children to be associated with those pejorative labels. We want a value-neutral descriptor. And it's our ableism that means that autism, the word, or autistic, is not a value-neutral descriptor. So I can talk to parents usually at this point about what ableism is and how our internalised ableism, the ableism that we've grown up with all our lives, puts us in a place where we actually feel that what that the word autism is 
belongs in a um, in, in a place that's not value neutral, that it's pejorative or stigmatizing. So the burden is the ableism. The burden is the social is that social dis the social model of disability. It's the disabling society, not the word autistic itself. So that's that's a way I usually try and deal with that part. I don't want my child to associate themselves with that severely autistic person. As I said, this one usually takes me quite some time, um, but. Um, I always start with that this is an amazing opportunity to talk about every person having different support needs, every person having different gifts um, and neurodiversity. And I'll when we come back in a minute to the how we talk to children about explaining about their autistic experience, um, these kinds of, these conversations are going to be really important. You're going to need to have them anyway. So what a brilliant opportunity to be able to have a conversation to see those inherent similarities um, between you and another person, but also the differences that we're not all alike and not all autistic people are alike, just like not all non-autistic people are alike either. Um, sorry, and probably also check your ableism, but I didn't write that down. Um, I thought that might be a little bit too um, confronting. <laughs> <laughs> um, my child doesn't need to know. I'm going to explain to to uh, <laughs> you in, in great detail in a minute why. But yes, they do. They do need to know absolutely. And here's why. And we can go into the reasons for that in a minute. And um, the conversation is too hard. Well, that's okay because it's not one conversation. It's a lifetime of conversations. It's a lifetime of demonstrating acceptance. So those are kinds of the things that I would respond to. If somebody says to you, no, I'm not telling my child because, um, you know, these are the sorts of ways that we can respond. As I said, one of the big things that we need to acknowledge <laughs> is that my child does need to know. And there are a number of reasons why your child does need to know. Your child needs to know because it's their identity, first and foremost. So I know identity is a really charged concept. Um, and I'm assuming that most of you will have some kind of background and understand identity. It's not an individual dynamic. It's not solely personal. It's not static. It's not singular. It's sort of a multifaceted, as I said, charged concept. And we know that identity is social. Um, and I mean, you think just in the last couple of years about the concentration on identity politics, um, and we can see how social identity has really become. We know that we form our identity through many different ways. Um, a lot of it is around belonging. Identity and belonging go hand in hand. So it might be belonging to a national group or a cultural group or a religious or an ethnic or a gender group or sexual group, sexuality group or subgroups within those. These are how we form our identity as a sort of as a concept, as a cultural concept. Um, but you know, we know that identity is shaped equally by our health experiences, um, our experiences of social disadvantage, our, so our experiences of social privilege. So that we've got to understand all the different ways that we are growing identity all the time. Um, and how much of a um, an evolutionary con um, charged concept our identity is. As much as identity can be used to divide people, and it really is, I mean, America has been a good um, example of that under Trump, it can also be used, of course, to unite people. And we are discovering more and more. I mean, it used to be that we used to think about um, identity and group identity, collective identities, um, it, as a way to explain, for example, um, how Germany, Germans in Nazi Germany could do what they did to other groups of people. So it used to be a way to explain how atrocities could happen. Now we have a counterpoint to that and really it can we, we're sort of looking at identity as a way to unite people, um, to build mental health, to build social self-esteem, 
and to build collective responsibility. And this is kind of the power of a social identity. And I'm going to talk more about social identity theory in a moment. So, but the big thing that we know is that realising or actually experiencing the consequences of identity, of how we identify or see ourselves, depends in part, or in a large part, on whether we are categorised into an identity group, so if somebody else puts us into a group, or if we identify organically with that group. So are we lumped in with a group? or do we organically identify? So categorization versus identification. And that's really huge in terms of how we experience our identity. And once we're in that group, how we compare ourselves with other groups outside of that group um, and how we identify ourselves um, is really important too. So basically, do we engage in intergroup discrimination? Do we experience intergroup discrimination? So identity, this concept is about, are we lumped in with people because an external source has said that that's where we belong? Do we organically identify? And once we're there, how do we see ourselves and how do we see each other and how do those others see us? And how do we feel about that? So this is kind of the theory that goes around, very briefly, that goes around the um, identity. So, of course, autism is an identity. It's a hardwired, organic identity. Um, so it's not context-dependent. You can't not be autistic. Um, it is an important way that we define ourselves but we have to also acknowledge that, of course, it doesn't confine us. It's not the only thing that defines us. And all of us are more than the sum of, we are the sum of our identities and autism is never going to be the only identity. But what we do know is that acknowledging autism as an organic identity is essential for our self-knowledge and that self-knowledge is in turn fundamental for well-being, resilience and self-determination. And because autism is also a social identity, so that's as a personal identity, it's fundamental for those well-being, self-determination, resilience kinds of things. But as a, um, as a social identity, autism also exists within sort of autistic community, autistic culture. That's how, that's, there is a social identity that goes with autism as well. And how we, as autistic individuals, interpret that social identity is context dependent. So that, that we are autistic is organic, it's hardwired. How we identify with the autistic community and the social identity is context dependent. How we experience our connection with what is basically a neuro minority within a much broader neurodiverse community, that's not automatic, that's not hardwired. We have to experience that. So as parents, as professionals, as academics, as researchers, we need to control the narrative so that we can help children identify with that social identity of autism, the, identity, the autistic community, autistic culture, in a way that doesn't other them through comparison with another group. So what we're looking for ideally, is to see that children self-identify as autistic in a personal, organic, hardwired way and therefore feel that they can identify within the autistic community, not that they're categorised by others into a particular form, and that they have enough collective self-esteem within the autistic community to feel individual self-esteem, when they look at themselves, but also to, um, to be accepting of differences outside of that social group. So that's kind of in a very long way of saying it's their identity. Um, partly that's why they need to know because we want to control that narrative. We want to make sure that we're setting them up for that success. 
So your child or any child does need to know because it's their identity and because it acknowledges their self-awareness and it gives them language to describe their self-awareness. Look, um, if a child doesn't know it already, uh, most children will understand at some point that they are different than their peers and there's no point in denying them that knowledge. We have to respect it, we have to embrace it, we have to give them the complete access to their identity to describe it because it's theirs. Um, as I said before, children are going to be labelled by very unflattering labels, subjective labels. So if we give them their identity, we give them the language and the capacity to reframe and to empower them um, to be able to describe themselves objectively and with an empowered self-aware um, kind of way so that they can reject the labels that they don't feel categorize them appropriately. So without self-knowledge they may well feel that they are lazy weird loners um, and that's not going to lead to good mental health. Your child does need to know because it's their identity, it gives them access to self-knowledge and gives them language to describe them, and it will help them to self-advocate. Um, parents often look at me quite weirdly when I talk about self-advocacy very early in their autism journey, but self-advocacy is fundamentally grounded in self-knowledge, and it's the ability to understand and communicate one's own needs. We all think about um, the kind of long-term goal of independence for our child, and it's a word that comes up a lot. But what I think is really interesting is that self-advocacy, which is going to lead to said independence, is often not talked about at all. So we need to bring this conversation into parents' purview. Self-advocacy, it leads to empowerment. Empowerment leads to personal autonomy. Personal autonomy leads to... And we're not talking about full independence because clearly everybody needs support um, with things, but the sort of independence that allows a person to live a fulfilled and happier life. So basically for our children, an ability to self-advocate really as a child just means that they're confident enough to know their own needs and communicate those needs to the families and communities in which they're operating. If they don't know their own needs, they cannot communicate those needs. So your child needs to know their artistic identity so that they know their needs. Um, so they have to be self-aware. You have to communicate as a parent or as a, re as, a, as a professional, you have to communicate accurate quality information about a child's diagnosis to the child because your child, any child, can't self-advocate if they don't know or understand their own needs. And that's how we're going to build up, as I said, that personal knowledge, autonomy, that independence. So my, my tip to parents is usually, and for professionals, is usually to use factual terminology and labels about what things mean for that particular child. So your job in whatever um, place you're working with children is to provide a child with a thorough and careful understanding of their diagnosis and their needs. So we use objective language, we don't use subjective language. We use, um, you, you know, a child needs to be able to describe their needs objectively. So giving them the right language is crucial to self-advocacy. Um, you know, it means looking at needs and accommodations and what talking about what accommodations a child has. What are you doing to advocate for your child on your child's behalf to get them the accommodations that they need to thrive and flourish? You know, if they don't know that accommodations are put in place for them, how will they ever learn to ask for them themselves? Or if they don't know that accommodations are being put in place, then how will they know to say that that accommodation didn't work? Um, it wasn't purpose it wasn't fit for purpose um, so you know it's all of those things and I also encourage everybody to talk about um, disability and the law with children because once 
um, parents and children are conversant with whatever your disability discrimination laws are, they have um, their power because knowing their rights is really powerful. It gives your child the confidence in an expectation to be advocate to be able to advocate and to be heard. And so it's those kinds of things that identity gives you because without it, you can't have any of those things. And finally, your child needs to know for all of the reasons that we've talked about, but also because it gives them a welcoming community. And we know as autistic adults that the non-autistic community is not always kind and welcoming to autistic people. So, I mean, the fact that we can talk about the autistic community being the gift of welcome and belonging is so huge um, and so important to mental health. We, research is beginning to show that even if there isn't sort of one autistic experience. You know, the diversity of the autistic community is huge, clearly. So there is a, there's not one autistic experience. But individual people, autistic people, can make meaning of their autistic identity through belonging to the autistic community. For a very long time, it's been assumed that if there was a discrepancy between, say, an individual's personal identity and their social identity, so where that individual either identified or was categorised into a socially stigmatised group, that that person's, that individual's self-view would be undermined. So um, I can't remember the um, researcher, but in the 1960s, there was someone who talked about that as spoiled identity because who you were spoiled your social identity. Um, in the early 2000s, it kind of, we explored the idea that if we reframe normalcy, that there's no normal, that everyone's different, um, maybe then um, disabled society or disabled, sorry, social identity and pride could, you know, spark not because you belonged to the disability community, not as within identifying with a group that had collective self-esteem, but, um, you know, because if we don't define normal as right, then hopefully people won't mind being um, disabled. And there's a, you know, I think the the whole, you know, I don't know if it's the same in UK, but in Australia, we still have the kind of euphemisms around talking about disability and autism like their dirty words. So you, you might have something that's disability or um, those kinds of things. Those, or even special needs is a good example. Those kinds of examples of euphemism come from this idea that if we re-look at normalcy, um, we can build social identity. But really, I think where we are now is to understand that there is pride in autism. There is pride in disability. So there's pride in our autistic identity. And we, that's what we want to gift um, our children. And that's how we do, and we do that through the autistic community. So it's not just that it doesn't matter that we're autistic, but that we can be proud because we are. Um, so, you know, I've, I've got a few studies here that are really important. I mean, in 2013, there was a study by um, Cloud, Lewis and Robinson, and they concluded that young people, they say, need to have exposure to positive role models to promote a positive view of autistic identity so that identification with this group can be self-affirming rather than damaging. In a culture where collective action is an important force for change and improvement, this becomes a political point. How can a group that is often disadvantaged and excluded by society advocate for change if they have no incentive to identify as a group? And we know that that's changing, that we are starting to identify as a group, but part of how we do that is making sure that we bring our children and welcome our children into that group as well. 
Um, in 2019, Lily Creswell and um, E.R. Lee Cage examined the relationships between autistic ident um, identity and acculturation, so um, autistic culture, um, and mental health in autistic adolescents. And actually, they didn't find any evidence, which was really interesting, to support a link between when you embrace your personal identity and your mental health. But they still concluded that it would be crucial for autistic youth to be exposed to both autistic and non-autistic culture and identity. And that that's quite, quite rare currently, that we don't expose autistic youth to autistic culture and identity, particularly not younger teens and children. Um, and, you know, Kate Cooper um, and her colleagues have done a few fabulous studies. Um, and the one in 2017 suggests that, you know, autistic social identity um, does offer a protective mechanism for mental health. So, you know, rather than masking to fit it in and be welcomed by non-autistic culture, when you have autistic social identity, there is an authenticity that comes with that and authenticity is very important for mental health. So we, we don't have any of those masking issues. Um, and in their study, autistic, in that 2017 study, autistic social identification was positively associated with um, personal self-esteem, which was mediated by a collective self-esteem from the autistic um, community, you know, perceived of as sort of this positivity around autistic identity. Um, and there were lots of negative indirect effects. So, um, so negative as in the higher your autism identification, the lower your anxiety. Um, the higher your autism identification, the lower your depression. Um, and that was through both collective and personal self-esteem. So this gift of community, of social identity is so important. So social identity, a social identity approach, which is basically what we're talking about here, is the reason why, why we have, we don't really have a choice. We have to gift our children um, their identity. Um, you know, we can, we're going to see um, increased collective and social self-esteem. We're going to have a protective factor against mental illness. We're going to lower depression and anxiety rates. And we're going to increase subjective happiness, sorry, subjective well-being, that's happiness, and increase resilience and self-determination. Um, so basically, this kind of social identity approach, this, this idea of, of finding yourself, finding your personal self-esteem within a collective, um, is really beneficial for particularly for marginalized communities to find, um, as I said, that social identity and that collective self-esteem breeds, feeds um, a self-esteem. Self so basically the big message here, and it seems to have been a very long time for me to come to the message, is that acknowledging that your child is autistic will definitely improve their mental health and quality of life. And generally, I haven't actually met a parent who didn't want that for their child, who didn't want to have improved mental health and quality of life for their child. Okay, so how do I explain the autistic experience to my child? There's a big caveat here. And the caveat is it depends a bit on the child. Um, but... I'm going to go through a number of options. The first option is using the difference approach. And this is approach, an approach where we start by seeing the diversity in the world. Um, and Erin Human's beautiful um, infographic, um, which, you know, is the diversity is beautiful, which you can Google if you've not seen it, is wonderful for this. You know, you can look around and start by noticing the ways that every person is different. And we begin by normalising difference. Difference is not something that is, um, that is weird. Difference is normal. And there's a really important point about that because, you know, um, if we accept 
that people look different, that people have different interests, that people have different strengths and weaknesses, that people have different things that they need support with, that people have different things that they are really good at and things that they, um, you know, can't be independent in. This gives us the language with which to describe autistic experience to children. So it's really important to, that children understand that humanity is rich with difference. And in fact, that the world, what makes the world such an amazing place, particularly as an autistic person with, you know, great sensitivity and um, details processing, is that, you know, there is so much difference in the world. And you can start um, by looking at very obvious differences um, and then move to much, much more subtle differences. And those differences, as I said, might be in, you know, you look at who's favourite, who eats what at home, you know, what are your favourite foods? Everybody has different, um, different likes and dislikes. And that's a good thing because otherwise life would be very boring and we wouldn't have any people to do particular jobs that we don't want to do. Or, or so this the difference approach to talking about autistic experiences, two benefits. One is your child's difference and they will know that they're different. So your child's difference or the child's difference um, no longer feels different. Um, it's not unusual for a person to be different. In fact, there's pride in that difference because you have something new and different and to offer the world. So that's that's part of it. And it also goes back to the I don't want my child to um, associate with that severely, you know, think that they're like that person. Because we can also talk about differences within the autistic community when that time comes. If children understand that what unites us all is the fact that we are all different, that's a really powerful starting point. And I often recommend just talking about differences as the first step in talking to children about um, autistic experience because it doesn't require the word autism. And so for parents who are early on their journey, that's important. It doesn't require... Um, any special equipment or anything other than observation and conversation around the fact that everybody has differences. And that's a really good place to start. When you've kind of got that, however, where do you go next? Well, sometimes actually children are already predisposed to feeling that different is wrong. So that first step is for those kids or that first option is for those kids who don't, who, who aren't predisposed to thinking that different is wrong. So for my three children, they never thought that different was wrong. They always embraced differences. And so I've never taken this similarity approach with them. The similarity approach is really um, useful for those children who don't want to be different who maybe um, who would just really want to be the same. And so this is the way that we talk about, we do exactly the same as the differences approaches, except with similar similarities, strange about that. Um, so the reason that we do this is that we can talk about the biological connectors. We are all we all have a mammalian part of our brain it is mammalian that has an um, it has a connection uh, drive. All of us have two eyes, one nose, and one mouth, or the majority of us do. That's that's probably actually not true. Um, it's a bit like um, we have in Australia a book called Ten Little Fingers and Ten Little Toes, and it was a real eye opener to my internalized ableism when someone pointed out that she didn't have a thumb, so therefore she was not like all babies with 10 little fingers and 10 little toes. And I realised that there was some assumptions, some huge assumptions on my part that went into um, appreciating that book. That's another story. Um, how do, 
when we talk about similarities, we are talking about innate similarities between humanity, the things that define us as who we are. And for some children, it's important to concentrate on those similarities. So the differences, um, not that you deny the differences, but the differences are lesser, not in a, not in a um, that's not the right word either. Um, the differences are, um, are less important perhaps than the fact that we are all united by our similarities. So just like we are all united, we are all similar because we're all different, um, there are other things that we are, we can talk about being, you know, a fairly universal experience. Um, and that sometimes helps to position children within um, a, a social identity that they can identify with. They may not be ready to identify with the autistic community and they want to see how they can identify. And so you can, we can give them the language for that. We can give them um, for some children, there is a caveat with this one as well. For some children, this really is triggering because they feel it undermines the authenticity of the, the sort of the specialness or the uniqueness of their experience. And to some children, it's just not appropriate. But it, to some others, it is. Okay. The experiential approach. Well, this is my one of my favourite approaches. Um, often parents, I think, have in their mind or we collectively have in our mind that when we talk to children about autistic experience, we're going to sit down and have a conversation that says, you know, well, um, autism, autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental um, uh, disability or developmental disorder. And it means that you have difficulty with social communication and that you have rigid, you know, and, and spout essentially the DSM-5. When I talk to autistic people about how they define their autism, it's very experiential. Not surprisingly, because it suffuses everything we do and everything we, every way we process. So it's not particularly surprising that we find um, an experiential definition compelling. But the reason that I put this here is that um, when we talk about autism as a word, and just as a segue, my children always knew that they were autistic. It was never a conversation that needed to be had. It was just a word in their vocabulary like any other word in their vocabulary. And possibly when they first said it, when they were very young, they didn't understand it. But they, as I said, they grew into that understanding. So um, I would look up some, um, so when I talk about the experiential approach of how you explain autism to your child, um, it's about looking at the core experiences that make autistic processing different and atypical. So you might talk about sensory things. Um, you might talk about um, orthogonality. You might not want to use that word, but that would be, you know, make, making connections and patterns. Um, and it's really lovely when you have an experiential approach. And I still use this because my eldest will come to me and say, um, Mum, do you remember we had that conversation 12 weeks ago on Tuesday about this? I just watched a documentary about this, which has nothing to do with the two, but it occurred to me that this and this are related in this way. And isn't that exciting because now I can see a whole new way of relating two things I'm really passionate about that I never knew connected. Um, and I can say to my 12-year-old that this is an example of their brain 
making connections and patterns in a very autistic way and and seeing pulling out one detail and juxtaposing it to another to make a new understanding that other people have not seen and how exciting that is. When I line up berries with my youngest little person and we classify them by colour and ripeness and size um, and we prioritise how we're going to line those up, I can talk about that being an, ex an autistic experience. So that each and every time your child is acting, is, is experiencing the world autistically, you can show that them that this is their autistic brain um, working. And the joy of that is that often the times that I can that I pull out and say, you know what, that's your autistic brain that's making that, that, that's giving you the power to do that. It's your artistic brain that's allowing us to be able to see the differences and the connections and the patterns. Um, that's your artistic brain that's allowing your senses to be able to discriminate between the details in that pattern that other people can't say, see um, or smell that smell or hear that noise. Um, it's also sometimes that's your autistic brain that make, that's making that transition really challenging for you. Um, I think there's autistic inertia involved here or whatever. But being able to put a name on um, the experiences that a child has allows them to see that like any brain process, there are moments of strength and gifts and joy and moments of challenge. And so... Um, we really build up that experiential definition for our children through reflecting on the experiences that they have that are uniquely autistic. And actually, you don't need to use the word autism if it's, you know, if you've got a parent you're working with that are offensive and they don't want to use the word autistic, you don't have to use the word autistic. Um, you can quite easily just... Um, talk about the child's unique brain. Um, that's your unique brain working in a way. So there's that approach. There's, my, there's the brain approach. Um, the brain approach is one that I think is really important because, again, it explains things in a way that children may not otherwise understand. Um, it brings together everything. It brings together the differences, the similarities, the experiences of an autistic person. So my favourite way of explaining the brain to children is Dan Siegel's hand model of the brain, which basically says that here's our brainstem, and I'm not sure, I know I've still got the share screen on, um, but hopefully you'll be able to see enough of my hand that you can, I'm just going to move it slightly this way because it's, um, very white. Um, this is our brain stem um, and um, the kind of the lower part of the brain with all the um, unconscious parts of our brain, the old reptilian brain, the parts that control our physiological kind of responses, our breathing, our um, sleeping and all those sorts of things. Our thumb here we close that over the top. That's the limbic part of our brain. And the limbic brain is the mammalian brain. It's where it's our center for emotions. But um, um, it's where our amygdala is, where you know our, our um, threat response is, and all of our emotions are held in here. And then we have the cortical part of our brain, the cortex, which folds over the top. And the cortex is the prefrontal cortex and these front bits here. This is our highest order thinking. Ooh, I'm trying to try and get my hand in the frame there. Um, but also, obviously, all of our sensory processing is here. And our frontal cortex sends messages to our limbic, and you can see how those two are connected, and then through to our old brain down into our body. Right? So this is fairly simple way of explaining the brain. And if you look at 
If you look up Dan Siegel on YouTube um, and the handrail of the brain, he does it a lot better than I do. <laughs> um, but essentially, there are two things that autistic children need to know. The first is that um, our limbic system, parts of our limbic system, are quite a lot larger than um, children who are not autistic. That means that we are doing a lot of emotion processing and that we are trying to filter through lots and lots of very big emotions. So that's a really nice way of explaining when there are big emotions and emotional regulation difficulties or you know, um, executive functioning difficulties. Our limbic system or parts of it are quite enlarged. We've got lots going on in our limbic system. The other thing is, is that now Dan Siegel talks about flipping your lid and then your prefrontal, whoop, your prefrontal, uh, here we go, maybe I'll go this way, prefrontal cortex not being connected to your limbic system, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, the most important thing is that our brains, autistic brains, are like festive Christmas trees. Lots and lots and lots of lights. So if you imagine that you see something and that in a typically developing child's brain, they will see something. It will go in through their eyes and to the back of their head, which is hilarious because that's where the um, part, the lobe of the brain that interprets sight and what we see, seeing stimulates. And that, that sends down to our into our limbic system and down into the rest of our brain um, messages about what we've seen and what we understand that to mean, whether it's a threat or whether it's something to be interested in or whatever. Now, in, a, in an autistic person's brain, so if you imagine that there's a string of lights in a typically developing person's brain from the eyes back to the occipital lobe into the systems that it's talking to and out. Now, imagine that Santa's elves have got really, really, really excited before Christmas and covered the whole Christmas tree brain with so many lights that they can't see the brain for all the lights. The brain, the Christmas tree, it's completely covered. When autistic people see something through their eyes, it's not just one lobe that lights up, it's our whole brain. And the messages that are coming into our slightly large limbic system our light, our, our lighting up all over the place. We have these very festive, lighty, lighty up kinds of, um, of, of brains, which means that sometimes it takes us a lot longer to process what on earth is what we're seeing. Sometimes it means that we get to make those connections. As I said, the orthogonality, we get to make the connections that other people wouldn't see because we've got connections between lights that other people don't. And sometimes it just means that we're really overwhelmed because all the lights are going off and we can't quite work out what's important. So sometimes it's really hard to discriminate, which is the most important thing because all the lights are going off. Sometimes it's really hard, just our brains are really, really busy, so we're really tired. So that brain approach I find is really helpful for children because you can actually bring together the differences, the similarities. Everyone has the basic same brain structure, um, but there are differences that account for the way that autistic people experience the world. And of course, the best way to do it is to have all of those options over time. What are the, what are the similarities? What do we all share that unite us? What are the differences? And again, it's those differences that unite us as well. How, what's the experiences? that we're all having um, as autistic people? What are those experiences that we can put down to our autistic brains? And how do our autistic brains work? Very quickly, because I promised Chloe I would stop at 55 minutes and I see I'm already well past that. So that's excellent. I'm really good at sticking to time. Um, I often have the question, what if I've told my child and they don't want to accept? The biggest thing that I can tell parents is that we always can have a moment of mea culpa. We didn't do it right. We need a do-over. Um, you know, um, Maya Angelou's No Better Do Better is really important. So sometimes it's okay to apologise and say, I didn't know enough about autism to be able to explain to you appropriately 
about autistic experiences, I'd like to start again now that I know better. Um, we all know better, do better over time. Um, and that's not a bad lesson for our children to learn. Um, and to trust that actually um, we have the relationship to be honest and um, objective and to be able to talk to them in a way that is respectful of their autistic experiences. So there are, there are times where we've just not done it in an ideal way. And, you know, I, I said, I, I feel like um, that's okay to admit that we want, that we need to start again. And the final thing I really wanted to talk about was what about everybody else? Well, there isn't, it's a nice easy one. There isn't really a differentiation because every child deserves to have an understanding about their own brain. Every child can do with that brain, um, not necessarily the festive Christmas tree part, but every child could understand how their brain works. Every child has the right to understand their strengths and challenges in the way that they uniquely experience the world. Um, every child has a right to know that each human has differences and similarities that unite us into the rich tapestry of, the, of humanity. Using the same language establishes synchronicity and it also helps children to feel connected. And again, we go back to social identity. We need our kids to feel connected. Take the opportunities to talk to other children, siblings, friends, cousins, as often as you can. The same thing applies. If there is an opportunity to talk about an autistic child's experiences and experiential definition of autism, um, absolutely do that. Do that with other children. So all of those kinds of principles of talking about autistic children's experiences hold true. Um, you need to be explicit and objective, but also you do need to have your child's permission. And if you're going to be talking to their friends about um, their peers, their siblings, their cousins, they need to know that you're doing that. They need to be able to feel that they have the right to um, hold on to or gift people their identity. It's their identity. It's their right. Other considerations, um, social motivation. Uh, you know, we may find that um, our children are not motivated by non-autistic friends or are really motivated by non-autistic friends, um, that they um, have um, a lot more generosity in the way that they define friendship or understand friendship. And I think I've got that somewhere as well. Um, bidirectionality is really important, that we're experiencing, um, that we're making sure that children understand that as different as they are to a non-autistic person, a non-autistic person is different to them. And so this is, again, back to social identity, that they feel that they have a collective that they can, that they can lean on. Um, so if you're thinking about social skills, that they are bidirectional social skills. And this goes to particularly when you're talking to those cousins and siblings and friends. Um, it's not about your little autistic person always learning non-autistic social skills, but the bi-directionality of that, and that that little person um, should also be able to teach autistic social skills to their non-autistic peers. Um, you know, as I said, we redefine friendships usually in terms of the way we connect with people about an interest. And so friendships, um, age peers, it doesn't seem to be a particularly big concern of ours. We would much prefer to have a friend who has a similar interest than a friend who um, is the same age as us. And that goes back to the social motivation thing is that sometimes when we're talking to other children about um, autism and autistic experience, you know, our, our child that may not, it may be our idea of our child's friendship from, you know, our own experiences, but it might not be our child's um, understanding of the friendship. Um, the best results often come from structured socialising. So, you know, playing a board game, something with, with rules rather than just allowing kids to 
go at it and hope for the best. Um, and so it's in those kinds of moments where you will have opportunities to talk because, you know, that's okay. Um, gaming is a really good one, particularly Minecraft and those kinds of things where you can actually connect um, and you can talk about autistic experiential strengths alongside, you know, um, uh, alongside what might be perceived by a non-autistic child as challenges. So I hope that's given you some insight today. I feel like I've talked for a long time and maybe not given you very much information, but hopefully that's not the case. Um, and um, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you so much for listening. Hello, lovely people um, that are still here. Um, I really, really enjoyed uh, Melanie's talk as well because I feel that she really answered a lot of the key questions that we see time and time again. And some of the questions are actually in the comments section. So the things like, you know, sadly, the your child hasn't accepted um, and now doesn't want to talk about autism at all. Um, and so what Melanie says is potentially you just need to redefine that conversation, um, assess that maybe you just didn't do it in quite a way that that child would be willing to listen to and, and being okay with that, right? Particularly if you're new to understanding autistic experience. Um, so being okay with not getting it quite right the first time um, and having that option and the opportunity to have that conversation again in a different way um, so I really liked that. So I particularly like a lot of the, you know, speakers that we might have on where you're getting sort of the, the theory. So you're getting the uh, understanding and the background, but also those practical skills of like, well, what do I actually do, though? Um, so I really hope you found some of the things that both Sam and Melanie said um, useful that you might be able to use to explain autism to your little person, your young person. Um, and I did make a note that I do have, although I haven't um, put it up anywhere at this point in time, but given the sorts of conversations I've seen or seen in the uh, comment section um, about, you know, well, how do we have those conversations? Um, I'm going to look into in the next week, I'll try and get up my um, basically neurodiversity explaining difference and people and how all people all human beings have challenges and strengths um, and so I think putting that video up which is uh, I kind of created those activities or uh, the event itself so I think it's uh, about an hour and a half so that you could do it as a family now if your young person isn't interested in doing that that's okay so still do it for yourself do it with your partner uh, maybe any of the other children um, if the actual child themselves who's autistic um, just isn't in into having that discussion or those activities but although obviously I focus on autistic experience the event itself or the session that I created is more about neurodiversity in general so I tried to make it much more broad so that you don't necessarily have to focus on autism per se so that's going to hopefully help people start to have those conversations and do the activities um, with your young person where it's just about what are my personal challenges and strengths and that means you as a parent need to do that too so you need to sit down with your young person and discuss the things that you really find quite challenging about the world um, but also talk about your strengths as well and then get them to do that and then you can look at the different ways the different groups and the different neurologies that have um, sort of shared challenges and strengths. So if you're dyslexic, there will be shared challenges and strengths for all people who are dyslexic, but then you'll have your individual differences and challenges and strengths. Hope that makes sense. So I'll try and get that up this week. Um, and we always try to make things accessible. So um, I will put up uh, a donation op option if people are on a low income as well, so that you can um, readily um download or view that activity so were there any let's just have a quick double check if there were any questions <laughs> this is symphony <laughs> um i did that magic because my hands are here um so let's have a quick 
uh, look in the comments section just to check I've not missed any questions. I'm going to get distracted now because there's some um, silliness going on. Um, that is Oggy. Uh, so just having a look if there's any questions. Uh, should be much more education on neurodiversity in schools. It should be part of the curriculum. Absolutely. Um, depends on where you are in the world. I do offer training for schools. Um, obviously, it's about the schools taking that training up. Um, but I do have activities and training that I can do for both the, you know, the teachers um, and uh, adults, but also to do as a school. So to do it as part of classwork or something along those lines. So feel free to have a look at our training on the website. So academy.com um, under training. Um, let's have a quick look. Uh, Elizabeth. Um, I've had a light bulb moment during the session that my son needs to have the information shared with him and all the explanations, stroke labels, and then given time and space to choose and be in control of how and what he accepts. Thank you for these two sessions. You are most, most welcome. I thought they were great as well. Um, fantastic finding new autistic speakers. I, I've learned so much in like a year um, from all the different people we have on. Um, Samara says, I would say this. Um, or would like to say, uh, parents, please talk with your children as soon as possible. This was not a thing when I was a child and it led to a lot of challenges. Wishing you all the best. We are all as one. Lovely. And you love the silliness. I know. <laughs> I've got some hungry people. Um, I don't have little people. I don't have young people, but I do have some hungry people that I need to go and feed. Um, so thank you, everybody, so, so much. Let's let you know what we've got on us. Ah, so and next week... Where are we? Let me just double check. Which will be the first, won't it? Is that right? I'm looking. Anyone want to confirm for me? Will it be the first next week? It's the first Wednesday. Okay, so it's the first next week. So next week I have for you guys um, a, a sort of refresh. It's all Academy refresh because as of sort of around May time, that will be our year. Um, that we have been running amazingly. Um, so we have a refresh video. So particularly for new people as well, but explaining who we are, what we kind of hope for the future and how to use Academy as well. So, you know, yes, we do have our lives. We have our groups. Um, we have all sorts of things and what we would like Academy to continue to do and what we'd like it to do um, sort of to grow our um, education um, and platform and so on. Um, and the reason that we're having to do it uh, as a pre-record that week is because we will be running the joint uh, Academy and Reframing Autism um, and Emergent Divergence Mental Health um, Conference. So it's an autistic mental health conference, um, which is being held over that weekend. So we will be very, very busy people, but you will get a video from us still anyway. So lovely. Thank you, everybody, so much. I can't see any questions. Um, so have a great, a great week. And I will go and feed some people. Feed Oggy and uh, Symphony. Christmas, Christmas. Bye, everybody. <laughs>